that the dominant intellectual culture of any particular society reflects the interest of the dominant group in that society. In a society which again is based on the power of uh, certain people to control and profit from the lives and uh, work of millions of others, the dominant intellectual culture will reflect the needs of, of the dominant group. And so that if you look across the board, the ideas that pervade psychology and uh, sociology and history and political economy and political science fundamentally reflect certain elite interests and the academics who question that too much uh, tend to get shunted to the side or to be seen as sort of radicals. The dominant values of a culture tend to support and perpetuate what is rewarded by that culture. And in a society where success and status is measured by material wealth, not social contribution, it is easy to see why the state of the world is what it is today. We are dealing with a value system disorder completely denatured, where the priority of personal and social health have become secondary to the detrimental notions of artificial wealth and limitless growth. Every time you hear the word freedom being said anywhere or government interference said anywhere, it means decoded, blocking maximization of turning money into more money for private money possessors. That's it. Every other thing they'll say, oh, we need more commodities for people, oh, this is a, a freedom uh, against tyranny and so forth. Every time you see it, you can decode it down to that. And I think you'll find a one-to-one -one correlation with every time they use it. And this is a sense in which we might call, it's a syntax, a governing syntax of understanding and of value so that it governs beneath their own recognition of it. So they may not say, oh, I didn't mean that at all, but in fact, that's what they do. Just like you may speak a grammar, and you have rules of grammar you follow without recognizing what the rules are. And so what we have is what I call the ruling value syntax that underlies this. So every time they use these words, government interference, lack of freedom, or freedom, or uh, progress, or development, you can decode them all to come back to mean that. Of course, when you hear the word freedom, it tends to be in the same sentence with something called democracy. It's fascinating how people today seem to believe that they actually have a relevant influence on what their government does forgetting that the very nature of our system offers everything for sale. The only vote that counts is the monetary vote, and it doesn't matter how much any activist yells about ethics or accountability. In a market system, every politician, every legislation, and hence every government is for sale. And even with the $20 trillion bank bailout starting in 2007, an amount of money which could have changed, say, the global energy infrastructure to fully renewable methods, instead going to a series of institutions that literally do nothing to help society, institutions that could be removed tomorrow with no recourse, the blind conditioning that politics and politicians exist for the public well-being still continues. The fact is, politics is a business, no different than any other in a market system, and they care about their self-interest before anything else. The first is this idea that the system has been the cause of the material progress we have seen on this planet. Well, no. There are basically two root causes which have created the increased so-called wealth and population growth we see today. One the exponential advancement of production technology, hence scientific ingenuity, and two, the initial discovery of abundant hydrocarbon energy, which is currently the foundation of the entire socioeconomic system. The free market, capitalist, monetary market system, whatever you want to call it, has done nothing but ride the wave of these advents with a distorted incentive system and a haphazard grossly unequal method of utilizing and distributing those fruits. Famines throughout at least the last century of our history have not been caused by a lack of food. They've been caused by relative poverty. The economic resources were so inequitably distributed that the poor simply didn't have enough money 
with which to buy the food that would have been available if they could have afforded to pay for it. That would be an example of structural violence. Gandhi saw this. He said the deadliest form of violence is poverty. And that's absolutely right. Poverty kills far more people than all the wars in history, more people than all the murderers in history, more than all the suicides in history. Not only does structural violence kill more people than all the behavioral violence put together, structural violence is also the main cause of behavioral violence. Oil is the foundation of, and that is present throughout the edifice of human civilization. There are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy, oil and natural gas, and every calorie of food you and I eat in the industrialized world. The arrival of this cheap, easy energy, which is equivalent, by the way, to billions of slaves working around the clock, uh, changed the world in such a radical way over the last century and the population has gone up 10 times. But by 2050, oil supply is able to support less than half the present world's population in their present way of life. So the scale of adjustment to live differently is just enormous. The world is now using six barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. Five years ago, it was using four barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. A year from now, it's going to be using eight barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. What's disturbing to me is the lack of any real effort from governments worldwide or industry leaders worldwide to do something different. I mean, we have these sort of attempts to build more wind power and to, to maybe do something with tide. We've got attempts to make our cars a little bit more um, efficient. But there's nothing which really looks like a revolution coming along. These are, these are all pretty minor. And that, I think, is pretty frightening. And the governments who are driven by these economists who don't really appreciate what we're talking about are trying to stimulate consumerism to restore past prosperity in the hope that they can restore the past. They're printing yet more money lacking any collateral at all. World oil production uh, right now is about 86 million barrels a day. Over 10 years, you're looking at roughly 40, 40 million barrels a day having to be replaced. There's nothing around which can come even within a 1% of meeting that sort of demand. If we don't do something pretty quickly, there's going to be a huge energy deficiency. I think the big mistake is in not recognizing um, a decade or so ago that an effort, a concerted effort, needed to be made to develop these sustainable forms of energy. I think that's something our grandchildren will look back on with uh, total uh, disbelief. You people knew that you were dealing with a finite commodity. How could you possibly uh, have built your economy around something which was going to disappear? Are there solutions to replace the edifice of the hydrocarbon economy? Of course. But the path needed to accomplish these changes will not manifest through the market system protocols required, since new solutions can only be implemented through the profit mechanism. And on top of it all, peak oil is just one of many surfacing consequences of the environmental social train wreck gaining speed today. Other declines include freshwater, the very fabric of our existence, which is currently showing shortages for 2.8 billion people and those shortages are on pace to reach 4 billion by 2030. Food production, the destruction of arable cropland from which 99.7 percent of all human food comes from today is occurring up to 40 times faster than it is being replenished and over the last 40 years 30 percent of the arable land has become unproductive not to mention that hydrocarbons are the backbone of agriculture today and as it declines so will the food supply and again since money is the only initiator of action are we to expect that any country on the planet is going to be able to afford the massive changes needed to revolutionize agriculture water processing energy production and the like when the global debt pyramid scheme is slowly shutting the entire world down 
not to mention the fact that the unemployment you currently see is going to become normality due to the nature of technological unemployment. The jobs are not coming back. And finally, a broad social perspective. From 1970 to 2010, poverty on this planet doubled due to this system. It's clear that we're on the verge of a great transition in human life. That what we face now is this fundamental change of the life we've known over the last century. There has to be a link between the economy and the resources of this planet. The resources being, of course, all animal and plant life, the health of the oceans and everything else. This is a monetary paradigm that will not let go until it's killed the last human being. The in-group will do all it can to stay in power. And that's what you got to keep in mind. They'll use the army and navy and lies or whatever they have to use to keep in power. They're not about to give it up because they don't know of any other system that will perpetuate their kind.